We move on to Group 13, Release Planning and Through Care Support, Access to Prescription Drugs. I call Amendment 86 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with Amendments 87 and 88. Pauline McNeill to move Amendment 86 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And speaking to Amendment 86, 87 and 88, this is an issue which the Criminal Justice Committee had pursued uh, following a, a visit um, to the WISE group, where one of the issues that was raised with the committee um, was about through care in relation to prisoners who were leaving prison but didn't always have the prescriptions that they needed on leaving. It could be vitally important because you think of all the reasons why people might falter or get into more um, trouble on leaving prison. It's making sure that they do have the drug necessary drugs. And in many cases, it was reported to us um, that this wasn't happening. So the committee had been in uh, an exchange with the prison service. And I think we've made some progress here, but it just seemed to me to be an opportunity to be more specific in legislation that it, is a, it should be a mandatory requirement. So, um, Amendment 86 in Section 2, paragraph the definition of relevant general service after service, would insert specifically prescription services. In Section 10, it would be the provision of facilities of access to prescription drugs. And Amendment 88 um, would insert, um, through care support, a duty to report on access to prescription drugs. The Scottish ministers must, as soon as practically possible, at the end of the reporting period, prepare a report on the operation of Section 34C during the reporting period. And the report must, in particular, must include information whether the individuals following within Section 34B7 have access to prescription drugs that they require for their physical and mental health, and whether medical and prison services have sufficient resources to meet that demand. Uh, so, really, that is the aim of these amendments. Um, I don't think it's enough, actually, just to have a simple exchange and be, have warm words that, yes, ideally everybody would want this. As far as I'm concerned, this is an absolute necessity that prisoners, for the same reasons that we've had in earlier uh, debates about not having Friday releases, but trying to set up a system which gives prisoners on release the best chance to reconstruct their lives, they should not be leaving prison without the prescription drugs. Uh, if the Minister can give me anything uh, in response to this, would indicate that the, the Scottish Government would take a really strong view of this. I won't move it. But I really think, as a Parliament, it's not too much to ask that the prison service at the very, uh, 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 and the NHS ensure that prisoners who have served a sentence on release into the community have the necessary prescription drug that they need in order to live their lives. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, Polly McNeill's amendments in various ways look to highlight the issue of continued supply of prescribed medication to prison leavers. I thank Polly McNeill for raising this issue and I agree that continued access to prescription medications is an important and essential part of the transition between custody and the community for prison leavers. That is why the bill includes provision that health partners must be consulted in the preparation of the through care support standards. These bodies must also comply with those standards in exercise and functions in relation to the provision of through care support. This is in recognition that continued health care support, including access to medications and addiction support, is an essential part of through care and release planning. It's not optional. Amendment 86 seeks to add prescription services to the existing definition of relevant general services within Section 2 of the Community Justice Scotland Act 2016. I appreciate the intention very much of Ms McNeill's amendment, but I do consider that it's unnecessary given that the Community Justice Scotland Act 2016 already includes physical and mental health services and support within the definition of relevant general services. 
That definition, therefore, enables bodies engaging in through care and release planning duties referred to in this bill to consider the provision of medication and other prescription services as part of the wider physical and mental health services to be provided. As such, it is not necessary to add specific reference to prescription services to the definition of relevant general services. Amendment 87 seeks to add the provision of and facilitation of access to prescription drugs to the definition of through care support services within this bill. Once again, this is unnecessary since the definition of through care support in section 10 includes help to access. Yes. Pauline McNeill. Uh, thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. But given what the Cabinet Secretary has said about existing provisions, I mean, we are still finding that there are gaps in the delivery of the service. And I would acknowledge that simply passing this today may not necessarily fix that either. But surely we can't simply rely on legislation in 2016 where it has shown to be, you know, it's not happening in every case. I wonder what more could be done here. Cabinet Secretary. No, and actually the point Ms McNeill actually makes about practice, I suppose I'm responding to the specifics of her amendments um, and uh, perhaps saying in a rather you know, arcane manner that you know, they're not required because actually the provision already e e e exists. What, what we are, of course, adding to uh, with this bill in terms of what already exists is pre-release planning which won't be optional and for the first time uh, pre-release planning duties are placed on other actors in the public sector. This isn't just about justice social work and the Scottish Prison Service. It does indeed include um, our health service who have to be at the table because they too, like the Scottish Prison Service, like justice social work, have a duty of care. And a duty of care means that people have a human right to their medication um, end of. And I don't know how, how more strongly and in an appropriate parliamentary fashion I could actually um, put put that fact in terms of how I certainly feel um, about it. Um, so um, I, I suppose what, what I was um, saying to, to Ms McNeill that, um, that her amendment 87, I consider unnecessary, and I'm sorry to say this, since the definition of through care support in section 10 includes help to access or make use of relevant general services uh, as defined in the Act. But of course, carried forward into this legislation, uh, and that includes uh, health services. So through care support also includes help to access or make use of relevant specialist services, which provides further comfort that any necessary support can be provided uh, under the existing drafting. Amendment 88 would require Scottish ministers to produce a report into the operation of Section 34C, which requires various bodies to comply with the through care standards. The report would have to include specific reference to whether individuals have accessed prescriptions. And I understand the intention of this amendment, and I'm bringing forward Amendments 60, 61 and 64 today to require the Scottish ministers to report on the operation of Part 2 of the Act overall. Therefore, a requirement to report on the operation of this section in particular would create duplication. I do appreciate that Ms McNeill and the rest of the Justice Committee have taken a real strong interest in how individuals released from prison are supported to receive uh, the prescription medication that they need. Uh, members may be aware of the guidance that has been developed in recent months regarding the provision of medication and prescriptions to individuals at the point of their release from custody. That guidance has been developed by the Prison Healthcare Network and circulated to prison healthcare providers. This guidance includes instructions on how individuals should be provided with a letter upon release detailing their current medication, which can be presented to a community GP, and that on release individuals are to be given medication or a suitable prescription for particular medications sufficient for 28 days after their release. And on that basis, I would invite Ms McNeill not to move these amendments. Thank you. I call Pauline McNeill to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 86. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the thorough answer and actually what I felt was a strong statement that was made in relation to it's not optional and that it's a partnership uh, arrangement on release. 
I hope the Cabinet Secretary wouldn't mind then. If I don't move, I'm going to hold the Cabinet Secretary to that statement. Uh, I think the Criminal Justice Committee has, has been acknowledged, felt really strongly about this. Uh, when we do visits, we do try and act on what we've heard. And I know other members feel strongly about this too. And on that basis, Presiding Officer, I'm not going to move. Can I um, ask Polly McNeill to confirm that she seeks to withdraw Amendment 86? I seek to withdraw Amendment 86. Thank you, Ms McNeill. Does any member object? No member objects, and Amendment 86 is withdrawn. We move to Group 14, Release Planning. And I call Amendment 46 in the name of Audrey Nicholl, grouped with Amendments 47, 48 and 49, Audrey Nicholl to move Amendment 46 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The importance of well-planned support for people on release from prison was a theme that the Criminal Justice Committee heard about uh, at length during uh, our scrutiny of the Bill. Uh, and indeed, in my constituency MSP role, I engaged with a number of stakeholders on release planning and on how provision around the process of release could be improved. So that is why I welcome sections 9 and 10, which seek to start that release planning at an early point and will drive consistency in the provision of through care support for people leaving prison. And I'm also clear that this will contribute towards keeping victims and people leaving prison safe. In our Stage 1 report, the committee broadly welcomed these sections and we will be watching their implementation with great interest. Another theme that was raised during the scrutiny and which I feel very strongly about is the importance of supporting people who are released direct from court, usually following a period of remand. I understand in those circumstances release is difficult to anticipate and plan for, and that makes accessing services extremely difficult for those individuals, rendering them on occasion extremely vulnerable. I recognise that Section 9, as currently drafted, would cover this scenario, as it covers release planning for remand and sentenced prisoners. However, I want to make sure that the Scottish Ministers and indeed Parliament have additional levers if further action is considered necessary to make improvements in this area. Therefore, I consider the Scottish Minister should have the power to make further provision in this area if they need to, particularly in relation to supporting people released directly from court following a period of remand, given all that we now know about how challenging that is. So that's why my amendments 46 and 47 provide ministers with a regulation making power to make further provision in this area should they need to, and why my amendments specifically reference the issue of release direct from court following time on remand. I believe that Parliament must have a role in scrutinising any future use of these powers, and that is why my amendment requires that these regulation-making powers are subject to the affirmative procedure. So, presiding officer, I hope that these powers are not needed and that sections 9 and 10 work the way that they are intended. However, I do feel that this additional power would be helpful to ensure that the outcomes that we all seek, reductions in reoffending and better outcomes for people leaving prison, are achieved. Uh, I move Amendment 46 in my name. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 48 and other amendments in the group. Presiding Officer, the importance of well-planned and holistic support for people leaving prison is a theme which has run through a lot of conversations that I've certainly had. In order to be successful, release planning must start from the beginning of a person's time in custody, regardless of the length of sentence or whether they are there on remand. That is how we will help people to successfully resettle into their communities and their families, and that is how we will keep them and others safe. And that is what this bill aims to do. 
The release plan and process introduced by this bill should lead to a community-based services getting involved at an earlier point in a person's sentence and cooperating to the plan for a pr prisoner's release and support them through the prison gates and beyond. Section 9 of the bill intends to deliver all of those things. I believe that successful implementation of that section, uh, along with the through care standards, will drive real and effective change. I welcome Audrey Nicholls' amendments 46 and 47, which provide Scottish ministers with regulation-making powers to make additional provision in this critical area with the approval of Parliament should we need it. I am particularly supportive of the specific reference in Ms Nicholls' amendment to these powers providing the ability to make provision about the development, management and delivery of release plans for individuals released direct from court following remand. And I am clear that the existing provision within Section 9 would cover this group of people. However, recent discussions I have had on this issue, including last week with leaders from the justice, health, local government, voluntary and housing sectors, have highlighted the challenges of providing effective support to people released in this way and the consequences when that support isn't there. And I would like to take this opportunity, President Officer, to thank Sandra Geddes for meeting with me at the request of Douglas Lumsden, MSP, uh, who spoke to me about this very issue um, at a meeting that Mr Lumsden, who was also uh, present, uh, supporting Sandra. Sandra's brother, Alan, was tragically murdered by an individual who had been released directly from court with no support package. And I would like to recognise Sandra's courage and determination in continuing to push for improvements in the way that people released direct from court are supported. And I hope that the changes we are bringing forward in this bill will go some way to achieve that. As I said at stage two, I think much of the answer to this lies in non-legislative solutions, and that was certainly the, the tone of the roundtable discussion I had last week. However, this is a difficult and it is a long-standing issue. And I therefore think it is prudent for ministers to have the ability to make additional provision should we need it to ensure that the release plan and duty operates in the way that it is intended so that everyone leaving prison, whether following remand or sentence, has their release planned for as much as possible. I therefore support amendments 46 and 47 by Audrey Nicholl. Presiding officer, I will now turn to the amendments lodged in my name Amendment 48 responds to an amendment lodged by Katie Clark and Jamie Green at Stage 2. Those amendments called for the Scottish Ministers to publish guidance and standards applicable to the development of release planning in Scotland and to publicly consult on these. As I highlighted at Stage 2, I was not persuaded of the need for standards in this area as I felt that would duplicate the through care standards which Ministers are required to develop under Section 10 of this Bill. I did, however, agree with the principle that guidance to underpin the delivery of this release plan and duty to ensure consistency in its application would be valuable. Amendment 48 provides for that guidance and Amendment 49 is an associated technical amendment. Amendment 48 would require Scottish ministers to publish guidance on the application of the duty to engage with the development, management and delivery of a prisoner's release plans within a year of the section coming into force and before the duty itself is enacted. That will provide partners with clarity on their roles and responsibilities from the outset. In developing that guidance, ministers are required to consult with a number of named partners. This list includes a wide range of expertise, as members will note, including the victim support organisations, to make sure that victim safety issues are taken account of in drafting of the guidance. The named partners who must comply with the release plan and duty as set out in Section 9 of the Bill must, when doing so, have regard to this guidance. Uh, OK, yes. Sorry, sorry. Yes, Jamie Green. Yes, absolutely. Don't Secret sound so enthusiastic, Cabinet Secretary. I'll try, I'll try and make it as interesting and relevant as possible uh, in that respect. Um, I just want to say, uh, I think there was a, an issue at stage two, which was clearly that we felt there was a need to include uh, victims' organisations in the consultation, but in doing so, did not want to unduly uh, assign any statutory duties to them to deliver through care, and I think that's a, a fine balance. I'm hoping that this amendment does actually deliver that. 
Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, 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 there's two, two points to, to raise. We um, have to um, consult with victim support organisations um, in and around the guidance that I've just talked about, and uh, we uh, ha have committed to the public consultation of through care standards uh, once that they are in draft, um, draft condition. And that will be a, a full uh, public consultation. And in fact, I think I go on to talk about that in the next group. Thank you. I call Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I just want to speak briefly to Amendment 48. And I want to um, thank the Cabinet Secretary for the meeting with um, myself and, and Sandra Geddes. And uh, although I was disappointed that my amendment in Stage 2 was, was not accepted, I genuinely welcome the engagement and the spirit in which the uh, Government Amendment 48 is, uh, is made today. As Sandra said in our meeting, we will be uh, watching carefully how the through care and release services develop so that the despicable crime that happened to her brother Alan Geddes uh, doesn't happen to anyone else. And for Sandra, that the search for answers on why her brother was murdered goes on as she campaigns still for a fatal accident inquiry into her brother's death. Amendment 48 to the bill may bring improvements to the release process. I welcome it and I look forward to the changes and the guidance that it will bring. And uh, I'll be happy to um, contribute further um, as it comes to. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And I call Audrey Nicholl to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 46. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, first of all, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for her support of uh, my amendments 46 and 47. Uh, and, and I note and welcome the additional uh, amendments moved by the Cabinet Secretary that provide um, comprehensive detail uh, around the guidance um, set out uh, in relation to release planning. Uh, I don't have anything further really to add to it beyond the points that I uh, set out earlier uh, and so I move Amendment uh, 46. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 47 in the name of Audrey Nicholl, already debated with Amendment 46. Audrey Nicholl to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 48 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 46. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move? Moved, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 48 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 49 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 46. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 49 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and we move to Group 15, Through Care Support. I call Amendment 50 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 50 and speak to all amendments in the group. Signing officer, the amendments in this group are all in my name and relate to the creation of minimum statutory standards of through care support. Amendment 50 changes the time scale for the first set of through care support standards to be published from one year to within two years of Section 10 coming into force. And I want to be absolutely clear that the reason for extending the statutory time period for this work is to allow for a significant period of consultation and joint development of these standards. A consultation requirement was set out in the Bill at introduction and supplemented at Stage 2 by the addition of uh, victim support organisations, families and organisations such as the Risk Management Authority to the list of required consultees. My other amendments in this group will require an additional public consultation which must be open for a minimum of 12 weeks. Publishing the standards within the original time frame of one year would therefore not allow for this extensive consultation to be carried out to the highest possible standard and incorporated into the standards. I want to get these standards right. That involves allowing time to properly listen to the stakeholders and communities affected. I have made clear that this is a priority issue for me and I will ensure that the development of the standards maintains momentum and is completed as soon as reasonably practicable. 
Amendment 57 requires the Scottish Ministers publicly consult on a draft of the initial set of through care support standards. The draft will have been developed in consultation with the partners named in section 10. The initial engagement with named partners and in development of a draft will include a review of existing practice and will explore the potentially different needs of different groups of people, for example, those released direct from court. And this, of course, if I can say once again, was an issue raised uh, by Douglas Lumsden, MSP, and, uh, of course, others on the uh, Criminal Justice Committee at Stage 2. I know this is an issue that uh, many are very concerned about, and I thank all members uh, for contributing to this very important issue. Um, following this um, initial engagement, an open consultation on a set of draft standards will be undertaken. As mentioned, this public consultation will last a minimum of 12 weeks. The addition of the further public consultation allows communities and individuals who have been affected by through care standards to have an opportunity to shape what they look like. And this has been informed by Katie Clark's Amendment 42 at Stage 2 and by engagement with victim support organisations. At the conclusion of the public consultation, Scottish Ministers will be required to publish an assessment of the responses and how they have been taken into account. My other amendments in this group ensure that the requirement to publicly consult applies only to the first set of through care support standards. Scottish Ministers, however, will not be prevented from conducting further public consultations on significant revisions to the standards. However, a full public consultation will not be required every time changes are made. For example, if the standards are updated to reflect a change in another policy area such as housing. Scottish Ministers will, however, be required to consult the name bodies in Section 34b4 in respect to any revisions to the standards. These standards will be vital to ensuring that through care support is consistent and reflects best practice across the country. Ensuring the availability of high quality through care support will help people to reintegrate and work towards more positive outcomes after a period in custody. This in turn will reduce reoffending and keep our communities safe. That's why it's essential that communities are engaged in the development of these standards and have sufficient time to engage meaningfully. And I urge members to support my amendments 50 to 59 today. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. No other members have requested to speak. Um, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary would like to wind up at this point? I would not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question is that Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendments 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58 and 59, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 51 to 59 on block. Does any member object to... Uh, Cabinet Secretary, if you'd like to move those first. Uh, moved on block. Does any member object to a single question? Thank you. Um, in that. Yes, can I ask Ms Clark um, to which amendment in particular the objection is? Before. 55. Sorry, apologies. 55. 55. Apologies. That being the case, we're objecting to 54, 58, and 59. 55. 55. Sorry, apologies. 55. 55. 58 and 59. <laughs> that being the case, we will put these amendments individually. So the question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
the Parliament is not agreed, we move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <laughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 55 in the name of Angela Constance is yes 90, no 20. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Sorry, is agreed? That's my fault. It's agreed. Oh, my apologies. It clearly is agreed. The question is that Amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Amendment 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Amendment 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, the Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Jamie Green. I would have voted uh, yes. That I can confirm your vote was recorded, Mr Green. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 58 in the name of Angela Constance is yes, 93, no, 18. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the question is that amendment 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The parliament is not agreed. Therefore, we'll move to a vote. The members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 59 in the name of Angela Constance is yes 92, no 18. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 87 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with amendment 86. Pauline McNeill to move or not move. Thank you. I call amendment 88 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with amendment 86. Pauline not McNeill moved. Not to moved. move or not move. Sorry, Ms McNeill. Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 89 in the name of Russell Finlay, already debated with Amendment 75. Russell Finlay to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 90 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 75. Pauline McNeill to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. We move to Group 16, Reports on Operation of Part 2. I call Amendment 60 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 61 and 64. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 60 and speak to all amendments in the group. Sign officer, I move Amendment 60 in my name, which responds to a number of non-government amendments lodged at Stage 2 of this Bill. Those amendments lodged by Katie Clark and Russell Finlay place various reporting requirements on Scottish Ministers in relation to several pro provisions within Part 2 of this Bill. I agree it will be important to review the impact of those provisions. That is why I committed to bringing forward a Stage 3 amendment to encompass all the various asks for reviews into different sections of Part 2 to provide a more coherent picture. Amendment 60 delivers on that commitment. This amendment introduces a new section to the Bill which places a duty on Scottish Ministers to report on the operation of Part 2 of the Act as a whole within a specified reporting period. That reporting period is five years after the Bill receives Royal Assent and I would like to explain why that period has been specified. The provisions within Part 2 will be commenced separately in an order and to a timescale agreed in discussion with our partners. We need time for these to be commenced and for resulting practice to bed in before the report can be meaningful. Amendment 64 in my name commences this new section on the day after Royal Assent. Amendment 60 has been drafted to be deliberately wide. Rather than listing every element that this report could cover, I wanted to have the flexibility so that we can cover as wide a range of issues as possible, not all of which may be clear until after implementation. I would intend that it would address the, the, the points covered in Katie Clark and Russell Finlay's Stage 2 amendments and Pauline McNeill's Amendment 88 debated today. That could, for example, include information on how the provisions in Part 2 are operating for men and women leaving prison, information on release planning for relevant individuals and the provision, the provision of through care support for remand and sentence prisoners. I would also like to highlight that my amendment requires Scottish Ministers to consult with a range of partners in the development of this report. That was a priority for me and, in my view, it is a critical element of my amendment. As members will note, the list of consultees includes a range of expertise and perspectives. That includes bodies who have duties under Part 2. It includes organisations like the Risk Management Authority for their expertise in relation to risk assessment and management. It includes third sector bodies providing through care support and those who support families and children affected by imprisonment. Scottish Ministers are also required to consult victim support organisations so that the perspective and views of victims are incorporated in the report. I am clear that we should be listening carefully to all these voices as part of this review. Turning now to Amendment 61 lodged by Katie Clark, that amendment would require that the Scottish Ministers review the impact of Part 2 of the Bill on the operation of multi-agency public protection arrangements within three years of Royal Assent and publish a report on that review. For a number of reasons I cannot support this amendment. Those are the same reasons why I couldn't support Katie Clark's uh, almost identical amendment at Stage 2. I am, of course, sympathetic to the broader public protection motivation here, if not the practical effect of this amendment. This amendment does not seem to take into account that the 2005 Act already requires each MAPA area to carry out an annual review, 
of the arrangements for that area and publish a report. The Scottish Ministers can notify the MAPA partners of information which they wish them to include in the reports, and the Scottish Government also produces an annual overview report of the arrangements. These reports can, at present, make comment on relevant public protection matters and could provide a mechanism for reviewing the relevant impacts of the bill relevant to MAPA if necessary. Amendment 61 would require that a review considers changes to national guidance, ensuring a consistent approach across Scotland. While consistency may be desirable in some areas of operation, MAPA regions can at present determine how they will operate at a local level, so this amendment does not appear sufficiently nuanced in allowing such local difference. Consistency is driven currently through national guidance, which is regularly revised with partners to take account of new legislation, as well as changes in policy and effective practice. I therefore do not think the reporting requirement that Amendment 61 is workable or necessary, and I ask Ms Clark not to press it. Presiding officer, I move Amendment 60 in my name. Thank you. And I call Katie Clark to speak to Amendment 61 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, um, presiding officer. And I will focus on Amendment 61, which, as the Cabinet Secretary has indicated, relates to the multi-agency protection arrangements better known as MAPA. These impose a duty on responsible authorities in a local authority area to establish arrangements for assessing and managing the risks imposed by certain categories of offenders. I lodged this immense amendment after the campaigner Linda Macdonald got in touch with me several months ago. She was brutally assaulted by the convicted mur murderer Robbie McIntosh in 2017 whilst walking her dog. The attack took place whilst Mr McIntosh had been let out of Castle Huntley Prison for a week ahead of a parole board meeting. He pled guilty to assault to severe injury, permanent disfigurement, permanent impairment and danger to life and attempted murder and he received an order for lifelong restriction. Miss Macdonald must be commended for the grace and immense bravery she has shown in light of this attack. She has been petitioning to drive change in the parole system to prevent dangerous offenders being released without sufficient monitoring with her Justice for Linda campaign. Multi-agency meetings had begun taking place in relation to Mr McIntosh as early as 2016, but key management decisions were not recorded, nor no clear action plan was made, and despite eventually undergoing a risk of serious harm assessment, no risk management plan was put in place. In the period when Mr McIntosh was on home leave, the local policing team were not made aware that he was on home leave. Ms McIntosh has since received an apology from the Scottish Government and a review of the updated policy and guidance for risk management teams was completed in 2020. I believe, however, there is now scope to tighten legislation in this area. This amendment stipulates that level three MAPA prisoners be monitored in the same way to equivalent offenders with regular check-ins with police and justice social work. It requires ministers to review and report on the impact of part two of the Act on MAPA arrangements. This would require consideration as to whether changes on national guidance were required and on how MAPA offenders were monitored after release from custody. And as the Cabinet Secretaries, that would ensure a consistent approach across Scotland. As the Cabinet Secretary, I did uh, move this amendment at stage two, and the Cabinet Secretary at that time argued that a timescale of one year, as initially su suggested, would not be workable. I therefore amended um, the wording of this amendment to three years, and I am disappointed if the Scottish Government feel that they are not able um, to support this amendment this evening. I move 61 and I will press it to a vote. Thank you. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Presiding officer, just to um, briefly uh, commend Ms Clark uh, for bringing to chamber the, the, the very powerful and personal testimony um, of her constituent. Um, I did lay out earlier um, the reasons why we couldn't accept um, the amendment, and I am sorry that Ms Clark 
um, is, 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 is disappointed. Um, I, I think what she highlights is the, the importance of uh, practice issues uh, and accountability in the, the delivery of services. I'm just very sorry that I, I don't think her amendments add anything uh, to that over on top of what already exists. But I do very much take on board um, the issues that she raises uh, and in the importance uh, of implementation, uh, practice and accountability at all levels of public services when it comes to public protection. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 61 in the name of Katie Clark, already debated with Amendment 60. Katie Clark, to move or not move? No. The question is that Amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. We will move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. <coughs> the result of the vote on amendment number 61 in the name of Katie Clark is yes 49, no 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 62 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 26. Cabinet Secretary, to move or not move? Move, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 63 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 73. Cabinet Secretary to move or not move? Move, President Officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are, and I call Amendment 64 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 60. Cabinet Secretary to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed and I call Amendment 65 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 42. Jamie Green to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 66 in the name of Jamie Green, already debated with Amendment 42. Jamie Green to move or not move? Sensing deja vu here. Not moved. Thank you. That ends consideration of amendments. Oh, point of order, Keith Brown. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I uh, seek your guidance? We have heard a number of amendments tonight which were considered at stage two, which were debated, but then not moved once they've been debated. We've also heard about a number of amendments which were debated at stage two, which were defeated, uh, and yet have returned at stage three. We heard one amendment which, had it been approved, and it wasn't, would have cost £59 million per year plus several hundred million pounds to construct a new prison had it been passed. So I ask, President Officer, is it possible that you could provide any clarity on the criteria which are used for bringing back amendments which have been considered at stage two to stage three? Thank you, Mr. Brown. As members will be aware, the presiding officers do not normally give reason for selection. The criteria that are carefully applied are set out in the guidance on public bills 
which is published on the Scottish Parliament website. The key issue is that the interests of all parties and individual MSPs continue to be reflected at stage three. All members must have the opportunity to input to and influence legislation and to fully scrutinise the laws passed by our national parliament. At this point in the proceedings, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. And in the case of this bill, in my view, no provision of the Bail and Release from Custody Scotland Bill relates to protected subject matter. Therefore, the Bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at Stage 3. The next item of business is consideration of Business Motion 9622 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you. I'm not George Could we have Mr Adam's microphone, please? <laughs> Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, and I call on Alexander Burnett to speak to and move Amendment 9622.1. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. Uh, I do not wish to keep MSPs here any longer than necessary. Unfortunately, though, next week the Scottish Government is insisting on spending parliamentary time debating a fantasy constitution in a made-up independent Scotland. I remind the benches to my right that Scotland voted no to independence, and the UK Supreme Court unanimously proved the Scottish Government were wrong. Colleagues. The SNP has to move on. Now, we know that the government likes to sneak out embarrassing announcements. Let's hear Mr Burnett. Now, we know that the government likes to sneak out embarrassing announcements in the dying hours before recess, with two statements currently scheduled for after FMQs next week. And my business motion amendment replaces Tuesday's independence debate with these two statements. It also inserts two more statements, one on Circularity Scotland, yeah which has gone into administration under the SNP and Greens, and the other is an update on the Agricultural Bill. Can we hear Al Mr Burnett, please? Although I note that a GIQ was lodged on this topic while we have been in the Chamber today. Also snuck out whilst we have been considering these amendments, amendments this evening was a press release that Azulox will not be permitted for use in Scotland. We should have a proper ministerial statement on this policy announcement tomorrow. And I note the presiding officer has repeatedly stated that announcements such as these should be made to the parliament in the first instance. Thank you. All of these matters are matters of importance to the people of Scotland, something which cannot be said of a proposed debate on Tuesday. I urge members to back my amendment at decision time. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on George Adam to respond on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. Minister. First and foremost, uh, presiding officer, those of us on this side uh, on the benches and the SNP benches respect this parliament and respect this institution, which is entirely different from those in the Conservative benches yeah. as well. Yeah. And sometimes, and sometimes listening, and sometimes listening to uh, Mr. Burnett is like watching the movie Everything, Everywhere, All at Once because there's snippets of reality there, but it's not quite right. And uh, part of that reason is that sometimes I feel when we have these conversations, he doesn't actually listen to what's going on. But as always, presiding officer, I will try to be helpful. And on the agricultural bill, we have already said there will be an agricultural bill. The Cabinet Secretary, Secretary has committed to introduce a, an agricultural bill this year. The bill will seek uh, powers to deliver the published vision for agriculture, and the findings of the consultation will be published shortly. On Circularity Scotland, the Minister for uh, Circular Economy has been given three statements to Parliament in Scotland's deposit return scheme in the last two months and appeared before the Net Zero Committee last week and answered a topical question on this very issue this week. Presiding officer, there is my belief there is more than a whiff of misogyny here as the Tories can t suddenly find themselves concerned about the catastrophic decision made by their colleagues in Westminster. Then they should raise these concerns with them instead of their grandstanding and stunts here in our chamber. 
and on independence, presiding officer. We are bringing our proposals for a modern constitution for an independent Scotland to this Parliament to be debated by politicians who have been elected to represent the people in Scotland. This is Scotland's Thank Parliament, you. and this paper sets out an ambitious proposal to protect and enhance the rights of the people of Scotland. Now, the Tories feel to Let's think that the rights of the people in Scotland is not an important thing, but unfortunately that may be the way the Tories think. That is not the way we think here. Yeah. This is the place to discuss the rights of the people in Scotland. And this time, presiding officer, more than anything, is the time to discuss them. The opposition frequently remind us, rightly, that the government is accountable to Parliament, and that's why we are bringing forward the debate to enable the Parliament to scrutinise and discuss this prospectus papers. The Tories are running scared of having a debate because our proposition is to enable Members. human rights at the very heart of Civic Scotland, whilst the Tories look to scrap human rights at a UK level. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 9622.1, in the name of Alexander Burnett, which seeks to amend motion, business motion 9622, in the name of George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Um, my device wouldn't connect, would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. I call Miles Briggs for a point of order. I call Miles Briggs for a point of order. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, my app didn't connect, but I would have voted yes. <laughs> Mr. Briggs, can I ask you to repeat that? I'm afraid I, I didn't catch that. Um, my app didn't connect, I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Briggs. I'm we'll sure that's recorded. Thank you, colleagues. The result of the vote on amendment number 9622.1 in the name of Alexander Burnett is yes 48, no 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that business motion 9622 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration. Okay. Members, I am going to take this vote on this occasion and this occasion only, and I'm going to make it absolutely clear if we cannot hear here that members are objecting or agreeing to an amendment, then we will act accordingly.
Thank you. So the question is that business motion 9622 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Stephanie Callaghan. My app wouldn't connect, connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Ms Callaghan. We'll ensure that's recorded. Point of order, Marie McNair. My app wouldn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on motion 9622 in the name of George Adam is yes 81, no 28. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions and I ask George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motions 9623 on approval of an SSI and 9624 and 9625 on designation of a lead committee. I'll move, President Officer, and good night. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> the question on these motions will be put at decision time, and there's one question to be put as a result of today's business, and I propose to ask a single question on three Parliamentary Bureau motions. Does any member object? No member objects, therefore. The final question is that motions 9623 on approval of an SSI and 9624 and 9625 on designation of a lead committee in the name of George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motions are therefore agreed, and that concludes decision time, and I close this meeting.